How big does a planet have to be to make it impossible to fly a rocket from it? Why are aliens always portrayed as expansionistic? Can a supernova make us all go extinct? And in our extended Q&A Plus edition, is terraforming Mars necessary for finding life there? Answering all these questions and more in this question show. It's time for the question show. Your questions, my answers. As always, wherever you are across my channel, if a question pops in your brain, just write it down. I'll gather them up and I'll answer them here. All right, let's get into the questions. Now, Pistol. How come images of globular clusters have stars that seem so near each other, yet they are light years apart? It boggles my mind. Globular clusters are awesome. And if you look at them and you don't feel like your mind is being boggled, then you're doing it wrong. Uh, they are some of the most incredible objects in the cosmos. Uh, you've got these spheres of stars, tens of millions of stars all collected together. They are ancient as old as the universe itself. They, it appears that they are some of the first stars that ever formed in the universe. How they came to be, we aren't entirely sure, but they might be the cores of dwarf galaxies that fell into the Milky Way and had all of their stars stripped away. Globular clusters are all orbiting around a common center of gravity that there isn't a thing at the middle, although there might be, you know, there could be intermediate mass black holes at the hearts of globular clusters. But in general, it's just the mutual gravity of all of the objects in the stars are all orbiting around this point. They orbit in a region that is outside of the main disk of the Milky Way. When you look at globular clusters, they're above or below the disk of the Milky Way, which lends to this idea that globular clusters are from various dwarf galaxies that fell into the Milky Way and were you know, dismantled, except for the central cluster of stars at the middle. The stars inside a globular cluster are incredibly close to each other. Uh, they are, you know, well, on average, stars in the Milky Way are about four light years apart. The stars inside a globular cluster are like one light year apart. It's the same kind of density that you would find at the core of the Milky Way. And so if you went out uh, on some night and looked up, you would see just a sky that is filled with stars. Uh, it would be very bright, and many of them would be very bright and very close. It would be awe inspiring. Um, it could very well be that there are planets on stars orbiting within globular clusters, you know, but we know that they are, um, you know, they're in general, stars can't collide. And yet it appears that there are stars inside globular clusters because they're so close ones that have have collided with each other, you would expect to see all of the stars to be old and red and dead. But in fact, there are occasionally blue stars inside these globular clusters, maybe the result of stars colliding with each other, you can see globular clusters with a pair of binoculars, uh, almost any pair of binoculars you can get your hands on if you know where to look, and you should know where to look, there's some in the southern hemisphere, some in the northern hemisphere, you see this tiny little ball, this fuzzy ball in the binoculars. And once you go up to a larger telescope, or you use, you know, you take a longer exposure picture, you can see what is just a mind bending collection of stars. So globular clusters are the best. That's that's the gist of this rant. Mr. Ickes, I don't understand the fixation on expansionism when people talk about aliens, maybe they're just chilling. One of the things that we need to be concerned about is that other advanced civilizations are expansionistic. So yeah, we would assume that only a small fraction of the civilizations out there are expansionistic. But the ones that are you've got to be careful about them, you've got to be prepared for them. It's the same reason that every single nation on Earth has a military, right? There are countries like Norway or Sweden that are chilling, right? They're peaceful, and they're happy, and they take good care of each other. And they will they will deploy tanks, and they will stop you from attempting to invade their country. And so you know, you have to consider that if you want to continue on your way of life, then there might be a certain amount of expansionism that is required to be able to just be prepared for the other kinds of civilizations that are out there. And so the other thing is that it would be a filter that you would not see the ones that are chilling, the ones that are cool and calm and peaceful, and they just want to hang out on their planet, they would be hard to see they'd be quiet. 
Um, but it's, you would be seeing the ones who are expansionistic, the ones who are taking over world after world like the Borg, uh, because they're just obvious, right? You don't see the gentle relative of the locust that, you know, doesn't breed very much and has a very special palate and doesn't spread and doesn't, you know, get into any mischief, but you sure see the locusts. And so, you know, that's what you have to be concerned about. Uh, not the super chill, really cool blue grasshopper. It's the, the locusts that are traveling in enormous swarms that decimate your crops. So, um, you know, it's sort of like a survivorship bias. Matthew Reuter, what is the limit of the mass of a planet where we could not get rockets into orbit? It's not the mass of the planet that really matters. It is the surface gravity. So you could have a planet that is much more massive than the Earth. But if it has a low enough density, and it's big enough, then the surface gravity would work out to be exactly the same. The surface gravity of Saturn is 10.4 meters per second squared, uh, which is only a little bit more than the surface gravity of the Earth and Saturn is dramatically bigger than the Earth. So um, the the question that I think you're really asking is, could there be worlds with higher surface gravity that you wouldn't be able to build rockets and escape? And the answer is, you know, theoretically, no, you know, if you're able to go the speed of light, you could escape from anything up to a black hole. But practically, yes. But the the answer to that is actually surprisingly large. So you know, you hear this idea that on Earth, um, that we're lucky that the gravity of Earth is, is as weak as it is that it you know, if the if the gravity on Earth was any stronger, we wouldn't be able to launch rockets. And that's, that's mostly true. But it just means that, you know, if you got to 1.1 times Earth's surface gravity, then you would require more propellant, you'd have a smaller payload that you'd be able to blast into space. So getting to space would be a lot more difficult. And I think someone had done the math that if you were on like a, a world that was like double Earth gravity, then you would need like a Saturn V to launch a 100 kilogram payload into orbit. Well, you know, like a Saturn V can launch whatever 70 tons into orbit, 100 tons into orbit. And on a two gravity world, thanks to the rocket equation, you would still be able to just barely get something into space. And then you can imagine once you had stuff in orbit that you could bootstrap the rest of your space economy, but it would be very, very expensive, it would be very, very difficult. And I always sort of imagine this idea that, that we hear from some civilization that's on a 3G world. And they're like, could you guys come and visit us or rescue us from like, Ooh, we can't go into that gravity. Well, sorry, you're on your own. Uh, we'll send you our media, but we can't come down because if we do, you never leave. James Valley, can a supernova take us out? Sure, if it's close enough. Within about 25 light years, a supernova would cause pretty bad damage to planet Earth, would disrupt the ozone layer of planet Earth and would allow more radiation from space to get in even closer than that would cause more direct radiation damage. And we know that there are no stars that are capable of going supernova within that radius. But it's happened in the past, you know, we see layers of various uh, isotopes of iron and other things at the bottoms of the oceans when supernova went off in our vicinity and probably caused damage to planet Earth then recovered. It's time to shout out all the new $5 patrons and above Derek Pilkington, James Kearney, Larry Cherniak, Sergey K, Indrik Stahl, Justin Bruno, Anne Hansons, KJ Paul, Billy Caldwell, and Stuart Ulfertz. Join the club at patreon.com slash universe today. Paige Potter, if we colonize elsewhere, will Earth become a concept more than a place? It's interesting. Um, I mean, I think we evolved on Earth. And so our biology is exquisitely connected to the planet. Now that said, you know, as our technology improves, and we are able to terraform other worlds, maybe we could make worlds that are more Earth like, but they'll never be as good as Earth. And so you know, I think you know, whenever people talk about how you know, millionaires want to leave Earth, they want to go to Mars, they don't want to go to Mars. I mean, they want to go to Mars in that you know, they want to be able to demonstrate that they can pull off the accomplishment of going to Mars, but they don't want to live there. I don't think Elon Musk really wants to live on Mars. 
So no matter where we go, Earth will always be this Eden, this garden, this perfect place for us. Uh, every other world in the entire observable universe that we can get make our way to will be a pale shadow to how great Earth is. And I think that will still remain very, you know, people, future civilizations will be very aware of that and then remember that. And they will have gone to other star systems to to explore, to try and spread the light of knowledge and humanity out into the cosmos. But I think they will always remember how great Earth is. And mostly because, you know, this is what we evolved in. If we evolved on some other, you know, Proxima Centauri B, then then we would think that was the best planet in the in the universe. But we can never find a place that is better than Earth for us. Never. It will always be the absolute best planet, the best gravity, the best amount of radiation, the best amount, the best mix of chemicals in the atmosphere, the best amount of sunlight that falls upon us. Uh, we cannot improve on this planet for us, we can improve on other planets for other life forms. But you know, we will always be uh, thinking fondly of Earth. Vicente Hedez. Hey, Razor, I've been following you since 2009. I believe you started during the International Year of Astronomy. A question is, what have been the keys to staying constantly active in astronomy communications? I've actually been doing this job since 1999. So 10 years before the International Year of Astronomy, we started astronomy cast in 2000 and six 2007. And one of the activities that Pamela helped coordinate was the International Year of Astronomy, uh, the 365 days of astronomy, she was on I think she was on the, the council for for that. And yeah, I mean, I've been very active in the astronomy community or in the popularizing astronomy community for 26 years now, and I'm going strong. Uh, what's the key? Well, I mean, a big key is that I was able to figure out a way to be able to actually monetize universe today without having to take on uh, university funding or government funding, you know, I'm able to fund the business in the olden days through advertising. And more recently now because of Patreon, that it's the people who watch our content are supporting the work that we do. Uh, for me personally, you know, like, it's kind of amazing that I've been doing this for 26 years, and I haven't gotten burned out. And I promise you, I'm not burned out. I love this. I love my job. I plan to do this for the rest of my life, hopefully 26 years more at least. Um, and it was like, I think, you know, I've, I've answered versions of this question quite a few times in the past. But the key is that you have to follow your own curiosity, that I, the you know, I do all these interviews on the channel. And, you know, I know people enjoy them. But the interviews are for me, the interviews are, are a way that I can explore my own curiosity about the space to learn new things. And then the thing that I love to do is share the things I've learned with other people. And so all of the information, the new information that I gain in having the conversation with people in my interviews, is I'm able to gain more knowledge, and I can become a better communicator. And I really love, you know, like, one of my favorite feelings is when you sort of share, like when when you have a telescope, and the telescope's pointing at Saturn, and if someone walks by and goes, you know, like, what's what's going on? What's this? And you're like, Oh, I'm looking at Saturn right now. Like, Oh, can I look through the telescope? And you're like, Yeah, absolutely. And they look through the telescope, and they see Saturn, and they look at you, and they can't believe that they're actually seeing Saturn, and they see the rings, just like it's in the book. And they, they can't believe it. like, is this going to trick? Is there a screen? What's going on? No, no, that's actually Saturn. That star up there in the sky isn't a star, it's Saturn. And now we're seeing a magnified version of it here in my telescope. And that sharing and connecting with people my excitement about the cosmos is one of the most gratifying things. And so I'm always kind of chasing that high, which is the more people who I'm able to connect them with interviews with the actual scientists, the actual astronauts, the actual astronomers who are doing this work who are working on these missions and stuff, the kinds of things that we enjoy, and to bring a level of uh, newness, right? It's the journalism side of this, like, I feel like, for space, things have stagnated that if you talk to a person, they're going to tell you about this, you know, the space stuff that they love, you know, they'll, they'll talk about cosmos, which was in the 1980s, right, which was great. But a lot of new stuff has happened since then. Um, or they'll point to science fiction that they really enjoy. But a lot of that is based on older ideas. And so 
the thing that I love is digging up all of the absolute cutting edge details that are going on right now and sharing them with people and letting people really feel that this is a vibrant field as, as vibrant as anything that's out there. Like the discoveries are happening as fast and as furious as people who are watching their sports teams, right? That's the level of coverage that I want to be able to provide for space and astronomy. So, um, just show up every day. That's my, that's the secret to my success. Pete Harris, I'm going to be in the Southern Hemisphere in June. What should I be trying to see in the sky besides basics like the Southern Cross? I don't know that much about the Southern Hemisphere. So I've been there once to Australia. Um, and I was there at a star party that was organized by Dylan O'Donnell. And there was a whole bunch of telescopes set out and I was able to walk around and look through people's telescopes. And I got a chance to see the Omega cluster. That's the thing that I've wanted to see. When we're talking about globular clusters, I got a chance to see the biggest and that is the Omega. And then there was a couple of other objects. There was like the coal sack nebula I got to see. There's some other, you know, dark nebula. There's a lot of really interesting dark nebulosity in the Milky Way from the Southern Hemisphere. The thing that really blew my mind from being in Australia was that the core of the Milky Way was directly overhead where I live in Canada. Um, the Milky Way is like down near the, you know, the core of the Milky Way is down near the near the horizon during the summertime. We get a couple of months where we can even see any of the objects down in that region and then it's gone below the horizon and then that's that but when i was we were there i looked straight up at the center of the milky way and you could just see all of these objects there even with your own eyes it's incredible um and then all saturn and a bunch of other planets happen to be in the area as well and so it was just again the planets are always sort of down lost in the haze for me but in this case i could see them really nicely in these big telescopes so I would recommend you go and watch Dylan O'Donnell's channel. He's terrific astrophotographer and maybe, you know, ask him if he'll give a guide to what's down in the Southern Hemisphere, but you'll just enjoy it. It's gonna be nice. Oh, and of course, the largest small Magellanic clouds, which I had never seen before. And you just see them. They're like little mini Milky Ways in the sky. It's very cool. Did you know that you can watch the same video with no ads and get a bonus question over on Patreon completely for free? We call it Q&A Plus. And this week's bonus question, could terraforming Mars actually help us find life there? And I'll put a link in the show notes. All right, those are all the questions that we had this week. Thank you everyone who put your questions into the YouTube comments and everybody who joined me for the live show, which I record every Monday at 5 p.m. somewhere in the world. I know it's vague, uh, but I change the time zone each episode. Now, I'm going to shout out some more channels, but first, I'd like to thank our patrons. Thanks to Abe Kingston, Andrew M. Gross, Bailey Griffin, Brian Bodie, Caridwin, Chuck Hawkins, Commander Bailock, Sai Nielsen, David Giltonen, David Matz, Dustin Cable, Evan Pro, Greg Feely, Hanschultz, Hudson Ward, Jay Graves, James Clark, Jerry Mattern, Jim Burke, Jordan Young, Marcel Smith, Michael Purcell, Modso, Paul Robach, Rank Kaidu, Robeck, Sean Sargent, Stephen Fowler Munley, Vlad Shiplin, and Wolfgang Klox, who support us at the Master of the Universe level. And all our patrons, all your support means the universe to us. All right, so I've got a couple of channels that I want to shout out. The first is Mars Guy, and this is Dr. Steve Ruff. He is with the Arizona State University, and he does a series of amazing videos about Mars. What things are the rovers finding on the surface of Mars? It really goes into the detail, so you're definitely going to want to check that out. Next up is Laura Forchek. She only has 4,500 subscribers, but does really kind of deep analysis on policy and has been covering the changes to the NASA budget. And so if you want to get a better understanding of what that is, check out her channel. And finally, this is not a small channel, but they're a little smaller than me. So I think that still counts. And this is Rational Animations. And they produce just wonderful animated videos about concepts in artificial intelligence, AI safety, AI alignment, things like that. And they're like really well written. The animation is great. And it really makes a lot of the topics quite digestible. And if you've got somebody who, you know, wants to learn more about AI safety in a pleasing, hilarious manner, definitely check out the Rational Animations channel. It's one of my favorite channels. So I thought I would give them a shout out. All right. Uh, we will see you next time.